individual for protection once they are found to be an individual for protection. But beyond this, there are more questions that appeal more to the territorial sovereign. Who is to ensure safety and security in those countries? Who is to ensure that dignified standards of living are available in those countries? And who is going to be tasked with the return of those who are found not to be in need of protection. The more the cursor is displaced towards the host state, the more you fall back into a normal, safe third country scheme with all the difficulties that we know, because the whole plan will be contingent on the state being safe for the applicant. Okay. So there are very complex legal and practical questions involved in this kind of mechanism. And actually, it may end up that it is issues of practical feasibility and cost effectiveness that suggest not to go that way. Because you need to try to imagine the cost and the logistical difficulties of systematically rounding up and shipping off all those who arrive to Europe or who are saved, rescued in SAR operations, and to run such centers at the expense of the European Union. This was the first concept, non entree There is another one which is more related to non-admission in admissibility policy. And that is the concept of controlled centers. These ones, if I read correctly the conclusion, would be located in the EU and they would be massive reception centers where the essential, the, the, the status determination procedure is made on the spot at the entry point so that any issues relating to the distribution of those who are found to be uh, eligible for protection only happens afterwards. The procedure, the cost, the uncertainty, etc., have been incurred. Okay. Now, provided that you have fair and efficient procedures, and provided that you can ensure a dignified standard of living to all those who are in those centers, it's difficult to, you know, argue against the proposal per se. It would be taking the current existence of the hotspot to its last, to its last consequence and essentially in, in envisaging asylum procedures as the entry point into the European space. Okay? But then again we run into the questions that we were trying to sweep away, which is basically the question of solidarity, first of all. It is said in the conclusion that those centers would be opened by select member states with full support of the European Union. What does that imply? Does that imply that it would be eventually an EU agency that runs the procedure at the cost of the EU budget? Same question arises in relation to reception and return. Will it be completely on the EU budget or will it still be, as it is the case now, predominantly on the budget that hosts those glorified hotspots. Uh, and what to do with the persons who are recognized as having a need for protection? The conclusions say it would be voluntary relocation. Past experience would suggest that voluntary relocation is not at all sufficient for all those who are eventually recognized as refugees. Questions are for later. Thanks. Uh, okay, so the question of solidarity that has been sent out of the door comes back out from the window. Huh? What will happen if there are not enough pledges for those places? Will those people have to be recognized in the state and by the state where the center is located? And of course, to top it all, you also have the problem that those centers would be open on a voluntary basis. And so far we have Emmanuel Macron who said France is not a first-line country, so no need to open one 
you know, on our soil. And you have the Italian Prime Minister who said, nobody asked us so far, and there is no plan to do so. If Italy doesn't open such a center, the question is, who will? Luxembourg, maybe. I'm looking in the direction of Pascal Schumacher, and that could be an idea, provided we organize airlift of all those found in the Mediterranean to Luxembourg. And then we have the experiences. We need to count on past experience, which is what happened in the hotspot. Is that a viable concept? I mean, the, if we look at the experiences made in the Greek hotspot, there were massive problems of reception, low pace of returns to Turkey, and alleged problems with the integrity of the procedures there. So it's not all roses, right? It's not a concept that you can take and say, well, it went all well, so we take that concept and we multiply it by x. So here, too, there are many political, logistical, and legal obstacles. I see that Philip start looking at the risk, and it seems that I still have got five minutes or 10 minutes. That's wonderful. So since there are so many unknowns and difficulties on the way, to fully realizing this agenda that was just barely sketched out by the European Council last week. One cannot dismiss out of hand that we are heading towards another scenario, which is certainly the most undesirable, at least from the perspective of the EU institution, which is the disintegration scenario. You know that the German Minister of Interior, who is still the Minister of Interior, if I understand correctly, uh, Herbst Seehofer, said that the concept he wanted to implement to solve the problem in Germany was to have rejection at the border of all asylum seekers who were already registered in another member state. Those of you who don't know the Dublin system in detail might think that this is an implementation of the Dublin system, not so. That would be a concept that violates the Dublin system, and I'll come to that in a moment. Okay. But, of course, if Germany goes ahead with the plan, the affected border will be the German-Austrian border. And the, the Austrian Chancellor has already stated that if the Germans do this, we'll do that. Will do that means they will close the Brenner and do the same thing towards the south, towards Italy. That was the axis between Germany, Austria, and Italy, if I recall it correctly. They, they say they wanted to form an alliance, and you see that there may be some thorny issues in that alliance. But in any case, uh, the whole debate that has taken place predominantly in Germany was to see would that be compatible with EU law? And, well, we already have a precedent to gauge compatibility with EU law, and that is what the French are doing in Ventimiglia. In Ventimiglia, the administrative practice, as it has been documented in a series of reports, is that persons who enter undocumented via the land border between Ventimiglia and Menton are systematically intercepted, identified, and sent back on foot over the bridge to the Italian police without any further procedure being done. If there is need, because the hour of the day does not allow to do the thing immediately, they are also confined in retention before they are sent back. This has raised a number of legal issues, part of which are legal issues of French law. I will not enter into that. It has been established by the Nice uh, Tribunal, for instance, that this practice, as it applied to minors, was in clear violation of a few articles of French law. But take seen from the standpoint of European law, there are at least two problems. One problem is Schengen law. Now, we know that France benefits, and it's been a few years now, benefits from a derogation. It was authorized to reintroduce border controls at its land borders. But it was authorized to do so to prevent the threat of terrorism. And the question is one of proportionality 
between the practice that is developed on the ground and the stated public objective that is being pursued. Uh, the question being, is it conducive to anti-terrorism to send back summarily all those who arrive at the border post of Hong Kong? And apart from Schengen law, where we could debate, there is the issue of EU asylum law. EU asylum law gives every prospective applicant the right to make an application when they enter in contact with an official of a member state. Making an application simply means stating the intention to obtain protection, even just verbal. And once that is done, the facility to lodge an application. And that guarantee is not being, if the reports are correct, is not being observed at the border with the further consequence that Dublin procedures are not being respected. Even in case where Italy would be the responsible state, you would, France would have to examine the criteria to enter into contact with the Italian authorities obtain their agreement and send the person back. In many cases, especially in case of minors who have not already asked for asylum in Italy, it is not clear at all that Italy would be prima facie the responsible state. So here, what is being done on the ground is to bypass completely the Dublin procedure. It's not been a French monopoly. The Swiss have done the same in Piasso at the height of the crisis, and Italy itself has done the same thing in the port of Ancona when with persons coming straight from Greece, which leads us to another problem. These practices are arguably, there are good arguments to say that they are in violation of the ECHR against the prohibition of collective expulsion, because the crucial element that is missing is the ability of those individuals to raise individualized objections to their expulsion towards Italy in the case of Italy. So if you have a generalization of that practice, there you really have a risk for the whole concept of a common travel area. And beyond that, that's risky for the EU as a whole. The EU exists to its law and their respect by the member states, and the moment that it appears that some parts of EU law becomes optional, then the EU is confronted to a very serious challenge and difficulty. There was another question, and this is something that the conclusions mentioned. Could this you know, violation of the Dublin system be somehow amended uh, or, let's say, eliminated if the member states agree, if they conclude what is called as administrative agreements under Article 36 of the Dublin Regulation. Here we are entering into a bit more technical things, but the real problem here is that that provision foresees the possibility to agree on modalities of implementation of the Dublin Regulation including shortening time limits as foreseen by the Dublin regulation. But it does not give the member states the right to conclude agreements which are against the Dublin regulation, and in particular, agreements that take away from asylum applicants basic guarantees of procedure. So that's a no-no in terms of Dublin law. Now, having explored the various points, and I think I've got very little time left, I will just make four concluding observations before leaving the panel to my fellow panelists. Uh, the first one is that if one reads the last conclusion, we are 20 years away from the Tampere conclusion, and we are a million miles away from those conclusions. We had started the endeavor of the common European asylum system 
under the slogan, an open and secure Europe, which offers protection to all those who need it. And we are ending up with conclusions that essentially say, we need to stem the flow. That's the one imperative that one finds in those conclusions. And all the policy plan that is elaborated under, under those conclusions is coherent with this general idea. The second point is that, as I hope I have demonstrated, and I am sure we'll see further, the so-called solutions which are listed in the conclusion end up raising more questions than the questions that they purport to solve. They raise a vast amount of legal questions, of feasibility questions. The two that are more interesting to me are, first, Again, those, the general idea that inspired the, the European Council was we cannot agree on internal solidarity, so let's skip that debate entirely and make sure that we let few people in so it will be easier to agree on solidarity. As it turns out, most of the solutions that are presented pose acute issues of solidarity. Again, disembarkation platform, what will be the distribution key of those who have been found to be in need of protection? And closed center, controlled centers on the member state, who will host them? With what money? With what staff? What are we to do with the persons who go to those? All the main difficulties are still there on the table. Not to mention the many issues of human rights protection. And when one thinks how extreme, in a way, the solutions that are proposed are, this is my third remark, one cannot but ask why. Are we in a state of crisis today? We've had one million of arrivals in 2015, almost 600,000, I'm talking about recorded arrivals, okay? 600,000 in 2016, about 200,000 detected irregular border crossing in 2017. Is that a crisis? Are we in an emergency? Something that would require draconian measures to be adopted? I would go with Colin and Fratzke, who commenting on precisely the disembarkation concept, say that it is a debate that is increasingly divorced from reality. At least, it may be deeply connected with the political reality. It is more and more disconnected from the realities on the ground, uh, at least it seems, if we are to trust the statistics that are given us by Frontex, by EASOC, etc., etc. And the last observation, the very last one, is that whatever the solutions, radical or otherwise, that will be adopted under the ages of the last conclusions, the core standards that are supposed to regulate the matter, the Geneva Convention, the ECHR, and the EU treaties have not changed. And it will be our tasks collectively, our means, the commission, the academia, the members of the government, etc., to make sure that beyond the lip service that is being paid to them daily, those standards are kept and are upheld throughout the whole process and whatever form European asylum law will take in the coming years. Thank you very much for your attention.